So yesterday we heard many amazing presentations and you know this has obviously enriched our understanding of the war in Syria. Today we have another two sessions and we'll follow the same format as yesterday. So we'll have our presentations from our speakers and the questions and answers uh, uh, session after the presentations have been given. So this first session is on war propaganda and human rights. We will have two speakers today, or sorry for this session, that being Dr. Drew Cottle from Western Sydney University, who is giving us his presentation he did concurrently with Angela Keyes from Charles Sturt University. And we'll also have Dr. Tim Anderson from the University of Sydney. We were meant to have a third and fourth presenter today, one being Osman Sofic uh, from Bosnia. However, he unfortunately, for unforeseen circumstances, had to return uh, back to his country. So, with the absence of not only him, but uh, another speaker as well, each presenter um, for this session is invited to speak for an extra allocated time if they choose so, um, just to fill the gap of these missing speakers. Now, the very notion of war propaganda and human rights are characteristics that shape conflicts in general, most polarised, especially in the Middle East. Propaganda and human rights were key terminologies used by US imperialism to justify the wars in Iraq in 2003 and the overthrow of Saddam Hussein. With the Arab winter, or more commonly or incorrectly termed as the Arab Spring, we saw the overthrow of Colonel Gaddafi in Libya and the destruction of Africa's most advanced economy that had uh, very socialist elements. I'm not saying it was a socialist country or a communist country, but it definitely had these strong elements. These uh, most particular being housing being considered a human right, you know, a human right, something that's not even seen in Australia. Free education, something not even seen in Australia. Free healthcare, free electricity, another thing not seen in Australia. Subsidised fuel, something also not seen in, in Australia. In the case of Syria, where these same socialist values are upheld, the same rhetoric that justified the overthrow of Saddam Hussein and Colonel Gaddafi were used against President Bashar al-Assad. The usual story of a tyrant from a post-colonial state that needs saving via, your, uh, via US imperialism to supposedly uh, civilise a brown people was also heard in the case of Syria. This is the war propaganda heard where human rights uh, becomes the justification of toppling a sovereign and independent leader that does not submit itself to US domination. And what happens when this narrative is challenged? Uh, in an imperial country just like Australia, those who speak the truth get smeared uh, by what Dr. Tim Anderson correctly terms as the colonial media. Referring to it as the mainstream media gives it a legitimacy that, does not, uh, that it does not deserve or should be recognised as. When against the colonial media in an imperial country and challenging the false propaganda emanating, they resort to smearing and character assassinations um, as myself, uh, Jay Tharapal and Dr. Tim Anderson experienced last week. Propaganda is the key element to US imperialism. We look at what happened in Shan Shei Kung uh, just a few weeks ago where up to 80 people, including many children, tra uh, tragically died. Even though no investigations uh, have been made because of the difficulty of getting investigators into areas controlled by Al-Qaeda, Western governments and the colonial media, including those here in Australia, immediately condemned and blamed the Syrian government for the chemical attack. Many inconsistencies and holes of this particular incident have emerged that myself, Dr. Tim Anderson, Madwa Osman and uh, Madame Susli have highlighted. For example, saline gas was used. Um, it was, my apologies, for example, it was impossible that saline gas was used because it's an agent that almost immediately attacks the, ner uh, the nervous and the muscular systems when exposed or when you become in contact with the um, unexposed skin. This did not stop the colonial media from pushing this narrative. The main group controlling this region, as I must emphasize, is Al-Qaeda. So the colonial media are actually relying on Al-Qaeda as ground sources or you know, a source for information to demonize the Syrian government. Al-Qaeda, I mean, you know, 9-11 wasn't that long ago. But this is the very propaganda that has been demonizing the narrative in regards to Syria. Then we look at the missile strikes by Donald Trump a few days after this uh, supposed chemical attack by the Syrian government. A US show of force. Was it a message to North Korea? Was it a message to China? Was it a message to Russia? 
Or was it a show pointing to show the world that the US is willing to militarily intervene in Syria? This remains to be seen. Many commentators such as um, say that this was the first US attack in Syria. Unfortunately, those people have a very short memory as we only have to look back six to seven months ago when the United States attacked uh, the besieged city of Deir ez um, The US airstrikes bombarded this, uh, the Syrian army positions on the outskirts of the city of Deir ez for over one hour. Now, I must emphasize that this particular city has been besieged by ISIS for the last couple years. Deir ez is a city in eastern Syria. The Syrian government has resisted ISIS uh, for years under a brutal siege under the leadership of General Zabadin. For over one hour, US led airstrikes with the support of Australia, and I must emphasize that with the support of Australia. Australia had involvement in this. Killed over 80 Syrian army soldiers and forced the Syrian army to retreat from key positions that put the besieged city and hundreds of thousands of Syrian civilians into further jeopardy of being taken over by ISIS. Of course, the colonial media passed off this event as no big deal that Australia had supported uh, ISIS. I mean, we barely heard about it. We heard about it a little bit. It was quickly passed off, you know. We accidentally bombed them. No big deal. Let's continue. Let's not even apologize for it. So without further ado, I introduce our first speaker, who is not only my friend and mentor, but he'll probably be upset with me for saying this, uh, a hero of mine and ideological inspiration, Dr. Drew Cottle, who, as a Jew himself, has been labelled anti-Semitic in the past as he does not follow the colonial narrative on certain issues. He'll be presenting his paper titled The Syrian War and the Strategic Logic of US Imperialism's Drive for Global Domination. Somalia, <clears throat> the 
the military occupation of Haiti, the bombing of Sudan and Afghanistan, and the UN sanctioned bombings attacks, you'll recall them, over Iraq for, uh, for nearly a decade. Then, the events of September uh, 2001 saw the US launch unexpectedly <clears throat> a war on terror as a, as a justification for its military operations, not only in the Middle East, but in Central Asia, and more frequently now in Africa. From 2002, a doctrine adopted, if you want, by the then Bush administration from the Security uh, Defence uh, uh, Committee suggested <coughs> that a war, of, a, a, a preventive war, sanctioned American attacks on countries seen as a threat to its national security. So American national security is now global. The scope of, of, military opera, of American military operations became both regional and global. New American wars, as we've watched them, have begun, and the old ones, the old land wars, have never ended. Think of Iraq, think of Afghanistan. I don't know about Syria. <coughs> Most recently, the United States invoked the threat of human rights to destroy Libya, as, um, as Paul Antonopoulos you know, just a moment ago suggested. The same pretext was used by the United States to organize and then energize its proxy war against Syria. Now, to critically understand the continuing war by proxy, against Syria, the American war against Black proxy against Syria, it must be placed, as I said, in the strategic context of America's efforts since its invasion and occupation of Iraq in 2003 to create what, if you want, the State Department, the CIA, <coughs> and successive presidencies have referred to, and not only can do, no, uh, Condizula, whatever her name is, Rice, <laughs> uh, suggested, thank you, a new Middle East. Now, despite the, the apparent failures mm, of its wars in Afghanistan and later Iraq, what the United States has achieved is to bring about regime change, along, of course, with social chaos, immiseration, and deepening sectarian strife, particularly in the Middle East. Long-time American allies in the region, do I have to name them? Israel, Saudi Arabia, other Gulf states, Jordan, and of course Turkey, despite some limited internal protests during the so-called Arab Spring, <coughs> have been largely quarantined, haven't they, uh, from the roiling violence that's gripped the Levant. <coughs> Now, due to its geographical centrality in the Middle East, hmm? let me see if I can use this. Scroll, <laughs> scroll down on the mouse. Scroll down on the mouse. Well, click the mouse. Scroll down. Here we have an Encyclopedia Britannica. Here's the Imperial <laughs> Expression <laughs> map. 2012 of the Middle East. You note, know, if you want, the. Uh, <coughs> Uh, uh, if you want, the, uh, <coughs> the dun colour, stretching from <coughs> Western Sahara into Afghanistan. And why not into China? <laughs> anyway, <coughs> despite the apparent failures, as I said, of its wars in Afghanistan and later Iraq, here we have a new Middle East. Now, <coughs> due to its geographic centrality in the Middle East. Its proximity to Israel, <coughs> its close relations to Iran and Hezbollah, primarily uh, in southern, if you want, Lebanon, <coughs> since the rise of the Islamic Re uh, Republic in 1979, and Russia from the early Cold War,
Syria has always been seen by Washington as vital to its remaking of the Middle East from the early 21st century. Now, it's our, we need to consider this in its occupation and remaking of Iraq. Yes, I use the word remaking rather than state building. America orchestrated a sectarian <coughs> war be between Sunnis and Shia militias, funded largely by, by Saudi Arabia. Iraq was effectively reduced to a divided and failed state. There's another, if you want, a United States estimation of various states in the world, <coughs> acceptable to both Washington and, of course, Riyadh. The continuing sectarian war in Iraq, of course, spawned, strangely, the emergence of the Islamic State, which arose as a force in the wake of the failed Arab Spring winter upsurge throughout the Middle East, defeating the weak, corrupt and dependent Iraqi army at Mosul. The Islamic State soon claimed its caliphate <coughs> over regions of Iraq and Syria. <coughs> of course, it's shrinking. <coughs> the rapacity of the Islamic State, its territorial occupation expansion, became the pretext for the limited and ineffectual military intervention by, by the United States. How is it that the United States could continue, uh, supposedly, its air war against, if you want, uh, the Islamic State, and the, exa the, the Islamic, uh, Islamic State continue not only to function, but to flourish. <clears throat> and of course, in this limited ineffectual military intervention by the, by, the, by the United States, its European allies, and of course, Middle Eastern trustees, as well as Australia, to it were to advance, of course, this strange war on terror in Syria. During the emergency period of the Arab Spring, America, you'll recall, responded differently to the ousting of its allies in Tunis and later Cairo. The Tunisian leader, Ben Ali, of course, soon found sanctuary in Saudi Arabia, Arabia and that old crocodile, you remember him? Mubarak <coughs> was placed under house arrest, of course, in his Mediterranean villa. <coughs> the radical demands that were voiced, at least allowed to be voiced in Tahrir Square, were soon ignored. In Tunisia and Egypt, soon enough, suitable leadership replace, replacements were elected. Morsi, of course, the moderate Muslim brother <coughs> became president, was tolerated, of course, for a while before being removed by General El Sisi because of apparent his advocacy of terrorism. So a military dictatorship was reinstalled in Egypt and it was much preferred by Washington to the temporary president, Morsi. So the American design on Egypt had only only been slightly adjusted with the departure of Mubarak. In neighbouring oil-rich Libya, um, Muammar Gaddafi, <coughs> who's very much an Arabist, <coughs> experienced apparently the Arab Spring winter through again the inexplicable rise of a jihadist war against the Libyan state. Washington and its European allies charged the Libyan leader with crimes against humanity. It seems an old call, this one, a familiar call. In, his, in, in Gaddafi's war against the jihadist forces that strangely just arose, particularly around Benghazi. NATO, of course, carried out its inevitable uh, airstrikes against what? The vital infrastructure and installations of the Libyan state, but not the oil fields. Gaddafi was murdered and Libya was reduced <coughs> to 
a regionally divided, <coughs> failed state, controlled by warring factions, free now of the threat of Western intervention. Human, humanitarian intervention had arrived safely in Libya. Everything had been secured. Libyan oil, of course, flowed generously without any state restrictions after being privatised by foreign energy cartels. Libya became another component in what some have referred to as, if you want, hmm, wrong way, here we are, the redrawing of the map of the Middle East. <coughs> Look at it. <coughs> Look what's happened. <coughs> Countries gaining territory are labelled in black. Countries losing territory, this is all decided, of course, in, in the war room, or the war college, they lose. So here we have, if you want, a redrawing of the, of, of the American New Middle East. <clears throat> so, with Washington's Libyan experiment as the model, I suggest, and the driver of America's proxy war against the Syrian state. Syria's first moment of the Arab Spring strangely occurred when popular protest arose in a, in, in a regional city in Syria. And then what happened? There was the killing, killing of police and military personnel of the Syrian state. The armed response of the Syrian state to counter this growing armed insurgency that strangely mushroomed throughout the country became a moral imperative for America and its now its European and Middle Eastern allies to, to do what? To demand, if you want, the removal of the Assad government in Damascus because of its crimes against humanity. Syria was to be redesigned as part of America's new Middle East. Syria's strategic position in the Middle East was central to America's redrawing of the Middle East. Its, its destruction as a functioning state would break mm, the axis of resistance. Iran, Hezbollah, and Syria to Israel which has significant designs in this new Middle East, drawn by the United States, <clears throat> and American hegemony in the Middle East. With Syria destroyed, Iran would be isolated and open to America's redrawing of the new Middle East. America's continuing five-year campaign, and it has not stopped in Syria, indirectly, armed, equipped, trained thousands of jihadists in various groups which were supported by NATO, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Turkey, Israel, Jordan, Australia <clears throat> in armed offensives against the Syrian state. Other components of America's proxy war in Syria, Islamic State and, and Al-Qaeda and Al-Nusra, whatever its name is now, to, uh, these terrorist formations were expected by Washington to do what? To exhaust the military capacities of the Syrian state. Now, without the limited <coughs> Russian military intervention to safeguard, if you want, Syria's in very integrity as a functioning nation state, America's proxy war would have left it as a chaotic ruin. Whatever may be the final outcome of its proxy war in Syria, the US drive for global hegemony <coughs> continues and reaches well beyond the Middle East. Its proxy war against Syria is a regional if component, so as I tried to outline right from the beginning, it's escalating confrontations with Russia and China for the, the conquest of what? The resource-rich Eurasian landmass. <coughs> Thank you.